You're tuning in to Lovecraft Country Radio. There's some strong language and spoilers ahead. Buckle up. Now, none of us knows nothing except what this cracker bitch done told us. So the ass says no. I ain't gonna help you kill yourself. Even if you too dumb and pig-headed to realize you can't win this game that she's setting up for you to play, boy. I told you this was a waste of time. You really gonna let him chase his tail? Looking for answers you already have. <laughs> I see where his son gets it. You real asshole. Woo! Well, well, Letty let them know. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) we said it's family business. There's a lot of family business going down in this episode. Can I just say how satisfying it was to watch her get them together? It made Mm. me feel really good, Shannon. We call that a gathering. Gathering (laughs) these men folk in the bar. I also love this scene because it's like, let this work as a takedown of the idea that Black people are a monolith. Like, politically, as far as community, we have, like, three different people and three different very strong reactions to a situation that is partly informed by white supremacy. We are not a monolith. We have arguments. We should be able to do that and then, you know, come together and go on an epic road trip. And this is the episode where things really turn for some of our heroes. I hope y'all are ready to dive into this with us. This is episode four, A History of Violence. Let's go. Welcome to Lovecraft Country Radio. I'm Ashley C. Ford, podcast host, writer, and horror enthusiast. And I'm Shannon Houston, a writer for the HBO series Lovecraft Country and mother to three free Black children. Amen. In case you've already forgotten, in this episode, Montrose, Letty, and Atticus go to a museum in Boston to find the pages Titus took from the Book of Names. So, Shannon, this episode, I... uh, This was a rough one for me, but also one that I I, I see that it's driving us forward. I'm excited to see where the rest of the story goes. You know, usually on this podcast, we pick apart a couple different themes from the episode. Right. But I really want to dig into the nitty gritty of what I thought might be the overarching theme of the episode, Mm. which was explaining how each character thinks you beat white supremacy. Ooh, I love this. I also love how you say thanks, because we are seeing three different characters really attempt to dismantle the power system. And at the same time, we're also seeing a lot of failure, right? Yes, a lot of failure. And that's still the question today, right? We're still asking ourselves that. Which tools are the right tools? Like, of course, we can't have this conversation without bringing up Audre Lorde's, a Black queer writer whose essay, The Master's Tools, will never dismantle the master's house. And it's a staple of intersectional feminism. I read it in college um, while taking a seminar on the history um, of the relationship between Black and white women since the founding of America. It's an amazing book. Everybody should read it. Yes, absolutely. And I had to kind of go back and reread it because, you know, you do read these things in college and then a lot of shit happens and you forget. So I wanted to just share one part of the essay with our audience as a sort of refresher. Um, I love this part and it really kind of puts into context what Audra was saying and what we were thinking about when we were working on episode four in the writer's room. Those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are Black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. 
for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. Mm. So there's that. Audra's words for me are a lesson in, one, dragging white women for filth when they, quote unquote, give you a platform, which is what she did. And two, using your imagination. What I mean is that it takes literally no amount of imagination to use the master's tools. We know what those tools are. Money, power, and all the isms that you have access to. And we're going to really get into this when we talk about Montrose and the choices that he makes throughout this episode. Again, those lines from Conditions for a Southern Gothic that I read in an earlier episode, they haunt me again, right? Lovecraft in the spirit of Audre Lorde is here to remind you that a lack of imagination will get you killed or will turn you into a colonizing killer, right? Absolutely. And you know, what this brings up for me as well, when I think about this episode and I think about, you know, the master's tools and things like that and that lack of imagination is, again, that idea that you can't be what you can't see, Mm. um, but you can't dream what you can't imagine. You know what I mean? Like, there is absolutely a loss that happens in this this breaking down of imagination. And when you're only working with what you know and you're not curious about what could be possible, to me, you're leaving bread on the table. Yes. And everybody needs to eat. Yes. So I think it's really important to talk about what happens when Black people get access to, quote unquote, the master's tools. Um, a lot of times these communities who have been oppressed for so long and, you know, let's think of white supremacy in a certain sense as a disease in that in order to be affected by it, you also have to be infected with it. We use the same tools in the same harmful ways to oppress others at times Mm. when we have no imagination about how else to use those tools. I think that this episode is a warning uh, Mm. about that. And I want to explore this warning through the paths that Montrose, Tick, and Ruby take. And I think we have to start with Montrose. Ooh, yes. Okay, Montrose. I can imagine lots of feelings about this character right now, played exquisitely by Michael K. Williams. In this episode, we start with Montrose, and we're kind of playing out the beginning of this toxic cycle where the oppressed become the oppressor. I think that up to this point, we've known that there's something violent in Montrose that he struggles with. In 4, we are starting to get more glimpses at what those things could be. The opening with him being drunk and, like, the trauma of his past swirling around him as he's drinking and suppressing but also lighting things on fire. He says that chilling line Mm -hmm. when he burns the book of bylaws, smells like Tulsa. Um, you can imagine what that's a reference to. Mm -hmm. And we'll be getting into that later on in the podcast and in the show. And there are these other hints at other things that could be going on with Montrose. We see it when they get to the museum, when Tree, who is hilarious, but kind of an asshole, and he's hinting at Montrose and Sammy's relationship. And Atticus is kind of trying to wave it off, but he can't. So you're definitely getting a sense that There are more secrets, this family and their fucking secrets, and that it's going to impact the choices that he makes and the lessons that he's trying to to teach his son. And I think one thing that we want to talk about, which I'm legitimately nervous to talk about because it is uncomfortable, but it is important and it's such a big part of the show. And the reason the episode is called A History of Violence is because we are also interested in talking about the history of violence in Black families. And I know, Ashley, you said, like, the tension between Montrose and Atticus has been hard to watch on the show, and it's really, you know, it's boiling up again in this episode. Uh, What are some of your thoughts? It's really hard to watch for so many (laughs) reasons, and primarily because that tension is familiar to me. You know, I know what it's Mm -hmm. like to grow up at a home um, with a parent who at times feels like a bully. I know what it's like 
to feel confused about your relationship with your parent, to love them extensively, and to also feel like something is wrong and they don't feel the way they should about you. Or Mm. that they have a really hard time showing you that they do. And that tension keeps coming back up because, you know, this show in a lot of ways reminds me of how Black parents sometimes try to prepare their children for the worst inside the home. I know that there's a narrative and a history um, that backs up that narrative of some Black parents in the home bringing pain to their children in preparation for the pain the world will inevitably bring them. And that it is considered in some cases more cruel to send your child into the world with hope Mm. than it is to cut it off yourself in the most loving way, Uh, (laughs) which is how some people see it, though. I, I am inclined to believe that there's no loving way to remove hope or to attempt to remove hope from a child. But you see that, you know, and we've been seeing this between Atticus and Montrose for so long. I mean, from the moment Montrose said to Atticus, you know, I didn't think you'd be dumb enough to read that letter and come Mm, here. mm -hmm. It was this thing for me, right? Because the person who showed up looking for his father, even if that letter was completely uncharacteristic, is not adult Tick. The person who answered that letter was Tick as a little boy who Uh. still had the hope that something was going to change in his relationship with his father. And that is a repetition that some people see in Black people's relationship with America. Why do we keep showing up? Ah! Why do we keep fighting? Why do we keep trying and pushing a country that it seems does not want us to survive? And the answer to that, I think, is complicated. But at its core, I think the answer for why we do that in America is the same as why Tick does it with Montrose, which is that this is the home we know. Mm, Yes. This is the home Uh. we know. And, you know, in the case with America, it's like, we built it. We did a lot of building. We put a lot of work into this home. We did. So many of the things that you associate with American culture, it's really Black American culture. Like, it's the home for us. And first of all, I just love looking at Atticus and Montrose's relationship and seeing the parallels to, like, Black America and our relationship to this country. I think that's so interesting and terrifying. And (laughs) I think I also see from Montrose, and again, this is also just like partly from being in the writer's room and talking about these characters and making sense of them and then falling in love with them to a degree. So I'm, you know me, I'm going to be protective of some of these babies. But he does love Atticus. And I keep thinking about that line when they first sit down at the bar the first thing Montrose says is, where did I go wrong with you, boy? Yep. It's like, I'm trying to raise a person who is going to be safe in this fucked up world. And I am doing it in very wrong ways, very abusive ways. But that is my ultimate goal is to keep you safe. And I don't really know what tools to use because in this country, we've only been presented with a limited number of tools of how to do that. It's very interesting. And I can't help but think about this deleted scene. (laughs) Deleted because I don't even think we ever shot it. It ended up getting cut. But ask any writer in the Lovecraft Country Room what the longest conversation was that we ever had about anything. And it was episode four, Diana and the Coke bottle. The idea was that during the road trip, they were going to stop at a gas station. The family would stop at the gas station. There would be a sign on the door saying, you know, we don't serve coloreds. And Diana would come out with a can of Coca-Cola. And Montrose would ask her quietly, how did you get that? can of soda and she would say something to the effect of oh it's fine the woman sold it to me basically like don't worry don't make a big deal out of this and Montrose was going to explode and we spent two hours simply discussing 
whether he would slap her in the face or slap the Coke bottle out of her hand. And the reason it took two hours is because most of the writer's room said slapping the can out of her hand is not violent enough. It was like a crazy conversation. And Misha had always warned us, this is going to be like therapy because we need to connect with this family and we need to make them real. And that means putting our own real shit on the table. But I say all of that to say, even though the Coke bottle scene isn't there, the reason we wanted it there was because we then wanted each character to have an opinion on what Montrose did. Mm -hmm. Was it the right thing to do? Is this how you teach a young Black girl about her place in America. Is this how you teach Black children to fight back? Right. By using these tools that are also abusive. And I'm saying the word abusive now, but if you had asked me two years ago in the writer's room, I was like, no, that's not abuse. That's discipline. That's Black parenting. Like, yep. that's what it is. So, like, a huge shift has occurred even in myself and then, of course, in the way that I'm now parenting my children. So looking at Montrose and Atticus... And the other characters and saying, like, they're fucked up. They're trying, Super but they up. are fucked up. And guess what? <laughs> A lot of us are, too. Let's unpack it. Let's figure out how to fight back. And again, this question of which are the master's tools, which are not. Is there any way to manipulate a master's tool to make it useful to our cause? And I think the answer at the end of this episode is, this ain't it. <laughs> right? <laughs> this definitely like, ain't it. Maybe no. there's a way to do it, but Montrose choosing to kill Yahima is a direct depiction mm. of the relationship between violence and colonialism and what happens when the colonized becomes a colonizer or when the colonized uses the tools of the colonizer. What are you? Who are you? Yahima Marakoti. Yahima Marakoti. Woman, man, two spirit. This was really, really hard for me because, to be perfectly honest, like the initial thing of it happening, I was like, the character is indigenous and two spirited, a character we rarely get to see in television. And then, like that, as quickly as they were there and a character on screen, they were gone. And that was so hard for me to see. I think Montrose's actions in that moment surprised me. Mm -hmm. But the idea that a person during that time would have done something like that to this person, to Yahima specifically... Like, here we are. Somebody yeah. who it felt like their othering made him so afraid. Mm. So afraid, which is an explanation, not an excuse. Right. But that fear put him in this place of like, I have to protect my child from more otherness, which yeah. I think is something a lot of Black parents confront <laughs> at some point. The idea... Ugh that, like, my child is already othered, I cannot bring more othering into their life or let any other othering touch them that might affect their life because their shot is already this big. So how do right. I allow them to narrow that window even further? Yeah, I think you're absolutely valid in your feelings about this character, who is sort of a big deal in terms of representation and identity and then gets viciously murdered minutes after appearing. So I want to dive a little deeper into Yahima's identity because I think it's important to give light to who they were and what they represented in that short time that they were on screen. Yahima is an indigenous person from Guyana referred to on the show as the land of many waters. Um, and many Indigenous and Native Americans use the term two-spirited to communicate a being of two or more genders. And that's really important for us to mention here. So uh, although this term was created to bridge Western and Indigenous languages, some people may identify this kind of identity as intersex. And though two-spirit lives 
somewhere on that spectrum, it's important to recognize that they're separate identities and it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. You can be two-spirit and also not be what we call intersex, or you can be two-spirit and be what we would call intersex. With that said, I know that a, a lot of people will watch this episode and will read this character as intersex, and so they'll watch Montrose murder this person and feel really angry about it. And I feel really angry about it. And Ashley does too. So you should feel angry about it. Um, But what else do we do with this? There's this part of me that's afraid that Montrose's act will will make the show read as queer phobic. Um, But what Montrose is doing is also necessarily queer phobic. Like it has to be read that way. And it's also complicated because of who Montrose is and because we're getting a sense of who this person is, and it's important to feel that anger that you feel at Montrose at the end of this episode. Um, and I guess I'll admit, I'm also saying that because I'm concerned about the show, and I'm concerned about our intentions and how they'll be read. And I'm really trying to, I'm going to try to push that aside, but I'm also admitting that there's something about that that's fucked up. The fact that I'm going, oh my God, are people going to think that the show is queer phobic? And I have to be open to that and also to just be like, you know what, if that's what it is and the show is critiqued for doing that, then that's what it is. And we need to wrestle with that and grapple with it and think about ways to tell these stories that are also not harmful to the queer community. I think that's the adult (laughs) way to look at it. You know, like as somebody who's not a writer on the show and somebody who's watching, you know, I can absolutely see how there are going to be some people who encounter that scene and think to themselves, that's the last thing I wanted to see, you know, um, happen to um, a character who is intersex and having that happen right in front of me, you know, is is really tough. But I think that there will also be people who see how it works into the story. And that's not going to be good enough for everybody. And I think that that's okay. I think it's good that it's not good enough for everybody and that some people are going to push against it and push harder in this space You know, and that's going to be excellent. You know, I think learning publicly has to be a lot more accepted. Yes. So we'll see how that goes. But, you know, it was hard for me. Like, by the time we got to the end of the episode, my feelings about Montrose, who I was already having a hard time (laughs) connecting with because of how he treats Tick as a parent. Like, for me, it was just this moment where it was like, is he another villain? Mm. We have to look out. Because of the people across the street and the people that's already in our house. Yeah. And that is a terrifying prospect. But as we've talked about before, horror reflects a lot of real life. And a lot of people know that horror. They know that story and they know how it feels and they'll connect with the narrative of this character. What are people going to think about Montrose at the end of this series? I don't know. But right now, he's so complicated. He's upsetting. He is agitating. And for some reason, he's still on our side, I guess. So it's like, what do you do (laughs) with a person like that who's on your side? Yeah. You know, as you were saying that, I just kept thinking of Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. Um, There's this line, and it's something to the effect of, Nobody can love you better than who or what they are. If Mm. if a person is violent, they will love you violently. If a person is ignorant, they will love you in an ignorant way. Like, they can't do better than that. And that's what we're seeing with Montrose and Atticus. And that's not necessarily an excuse for Montrose's behavior, but it is a way to understand, like, he literally can't do better than what he's doing. This is how he knows how to love. Violence, emotional abuse, all of these things. And I think... Atticus's reaction to that is that he turns to education as a means of freedom. And, you know, Montrose is like, kind of like violence is freedom. Burning things down is freedom, which is kind of like running away, like just staying out of the way. That's Mm -hmm. freedom. Or at least something close to it that means survival. And then Tick is turning 
you know, if you think about this episode, he's in the library, right? Like, he goes to research. How do we defeat these people? Okay, we need to find out what tools they have and where those tools are and where they originated. And so he's in the library doing this research. I think Tick escaped into books not because of white supremacy directly, but because of his father. Like, that was the escape from this person who is kind of like the definition of having a lack of imagination, right? I mean, if somebody calls you stupid when you ask the wrong question, Mm -hmm. if somebody responds to what you feel like as innocent questions, as if you are maliciously trying to agitate or upset them— eventually they don't feel safe to ask questions. Exactly. And when you don't feel safe to ask people questions, you still need answers. Mm. Where are you going to find them? You know? And so I feel like Tick turns to books. Just saying that out loud again, I'm thinking of Letty and Atticus, right? Because they have this confrontation in the library and it is intense and she is pissed and this fucking guy has his bag packed, meaning he was about to bounce. And I feel like part of the lesson there is like, we just watched Letty really discover the concept of community in episode three and what that means, what her role is. I mean, literally even by bringing those ghosts back to life so that they could die properly. That was an act of community love. And Atticus is not there. He's in the library by himself. He wants to Mm -hmm. go to the museum by himself. We talked in the writer's room a lot about him being a lone wolf and how problematic that is. So I also feel like Atticus is a great example of, like, if you think of him as an intellectual type, it's like... What is the point of all that reading and all that intellect if it's only for you and for your survival? It's not enough without community. So Letty is showing up and Letty's like, bitch, they're coming after me too. This bitch just showed up at my house while she was listening to Rihanna in her car. Like, (laughs) what's happening? (laughs) So I need the tools too. You can't just be sitting here in the library hoarding this information. So there's also something there about like, again, academia and education and even that Audre Lorde quote that I read at the beginning. It's like, but what about the fucking people? Like the actual oh, yeah. people, right? Oh, yeah. This scene is also giving me really strong Raiders of the Lost Ark vibe <laughs> because, you know, like Indiana Jones, you know, I work alone. I'm such a, I'm such a mm. loner. Like, if you come, you're going to get hurt. I don't need you. I'm yes. going to have to end up saving you. Like, it is such an Indiana Jones attitude. And she comes rolling in just like the love interest in mm. Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, initially, like, listen here, motherfucker. <laughs> like, this is what it is. This is what it's going to be. You're a bad yes. listener. You're an asshole. The yes. world doesn't revolve around you. And it just, like, this thing playing out between the two of them is also something playing out between the concept of, like, a male-dominated, like, academic research-based, like, (laughs) let's go down this rabbit hole, and a woman's intuition and a woman's knowledge basically being, like, when you know, you go. Right. And reach out to your people. You know, she's got that great line where she's like, your fucking dad was already here. He read all these books. Again, like, there are people in your life who actually already did the work and have the tools. Now, they might not want to share those tools with you. But (laughs) again, let's branch out and see who else we can take on this journey. As someone who was in the writer's room as this character was being developed, as you guys were deciding what he would and would not do, what were some of the things you thought of as like, his kind of books, his kind of music. Like, what would Atticus be doing right now? Yeah, I mean, Atticus is an escapist, right? He wants Mm -hmm. to live in other worlds. To me, that's kind of how he is, like, escaping a lot of what was really childhood trauma Mm -hmm. and escaping into literature and escaping into these, like, incredible stories. I think that there's a downside to it. And also, like... Because reading reading itself is is an individual act. Writing itself a lot of the time is an individual activity. And that in and of itself can make you bad at being a team player, right? Like, And I think that that's true for Atticus. And you see it in this episode where he's like, I fucking don't want you guys doing this. Right. I don't want you 
running through tunnels with me because now I have to help you get across this plank. Like, right. I could have done this by myself. And he snaps at Letty, like, in one scene, and it's really fucked up. But I think all of that is connected to a person who escapes into books, who's like, I entertain myself, I survive by myself, I fight by myself, I die by myself. And Letty's like, fuck that, we're coming. <laughs> That scene where he snaps at Letty is mm-hmm. also, to me, a. it was such a quick but perfect representation of what it looks like in a transference of trauma. Mm. Because Montrose is mean and impatient and pushing yep. to Atticus and Atticus immediately transfers it to Letty. Yep. Because that is, for most of us, that is our defense when somebody comes at us with that kind of rage, that kind of, not even like you've done wrong, but legitimately like you are wrong. Mm. You are wrong. And you don't know what to do with that, especially if you're used to pointing it inside. You get upset and you're like, no, I'm not pointing this one at me. I'm pointing this one outward. But you don't point it at the person who pointed it at you. Is that what they taught you with the imperialist army? Leave soldiers behind! No, I, I've never left a man behind, you hear me? Ever. Out in the trenches, I can trust those standing next to me. What hell is that supposed to mean? Why you know so much about the sons of Adam? George gave me the order of the ancient dawn bylaws the night he died. Where's the book now? I read it and I burnt it! What? You heard me. Why would you do that? Answer me, why'd you do that? Because my brother told me to protect our family. That was his dying wish. And I did it the night I burnt that damn book. Closing Pandora's box once and for all. Why are you here helping us anyway? Because your stubborn ass won't stop, dick! Seeing those flashes of anger from Atticus remind you that he is Montrose's son. Yep. Whether he wants to be or not, whether he thinks he is her not or not, that is his father. That's who raised him. Very similarly, yes. in, ep- in episode three, we saw that with Letty. Letty talks all this shit about her mom, and then Ruby has to remind her, the shit you just pulled is very mom-like. Yep. And there's something... Again, to go back to the idea of Black people in America, like as much as we are fighting against a lot of what this country has done, how much has this country imprinted on us what it means to be a human being? Mm. And it's no wonder that we end up using some of those tools that we know don't really serve our community. And speaking of the tools and the community and what we're supposed to do with it, we have to talk about Ruby. Um, She had a few scenes in this episode, but she has a very different approach to how to play this game, what tools to use, and how to use them. So for you right now, Ashley, what is your impression of Ruby so far? Ruby is intense. Um, And rightfully so. She is tired. Mm -hmm. She is, I think, at a point where being looked over is no longer something she can sort of delude or protect herself from in terms of, like, dreams of achievement. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, well, I'm just going to try again at the store. You know, when the people don't clap for her, (laughs) you know, at the end of this thing, she says, well, fuck you too. Like, she's over it. I love it. She's done. She's always been a person on this show so far who said what she meant and who made it plain and who was clear from the beginning. But she is also very much a person who judges and who believes that she's already doing everything right. And the only thing that has ever and will ever hold her back is the skin she was born into and the limitations that have been put on her Mm. life by other people. Mm. Right. Yes. Yes. And what I like about Ruby, and I fucking struggled with this character. Like, reading the book, I was not a huge fan. And Mm -hmm. then in the writer's room, when we really got to dive in and talk about, again, like, just because you wouldn't use that particular tool, it doesn't mean that this person is a bad person or wrong. We're all literally like, what fucking tools can we use to win? 
And her tool in this case, it's like, I need to be first and I need to be first in that department store. Did you just start working here? Yes. Yesterday, in fact. Do you shop here often? No, I... I didn't realize this store was hiring color girls. I know. I applied on a whim. Can't believe I actually got it. I love this. Like, she shows up, and there's a woman behind the counter, and we were specific that the woman needed to be a woman who was about the same color as her. Because if she Mm -hmm. was really light-skinned, then it almost simplifies it. You go, oh, of course. But the interesting thing is that they're about the same skin tone, and they look different, but both beautiful Black women. Mm -hmm. But Ruby knows how this works. There's only ever room for one. Right. So, of course, that's what it turns into. Of course, it's hard to be happy for the black girl at the counter when you know that that means you're never going to fucking work there. Right. It's the idea that somebody else handed us a situation where the scarcity mindset was the most logical one, even though the scarcity is not real. Yes. It's not that there aren't enough jobs or positions. The scarcity is created and we are forced to respond to it as if it is real. And Ruby has been stuck in that system for who knows how long, you know? And who wouldn't be tired? Who isn't tired? Mm. Like, this is 2020, and I'm tired. Fucking tired. So I can't even imagine how tired this character must be with seeing this played out in society over and over, having her heart broken over and over, and then having this other woman apply on a whim after she dreamed and drugged. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? Like she plotted on that job. She plotted on a job at a department store and somebody who applied on a whim got it. And now her dream is done. Her dream is gone. And in its place, ain't nothing but a white man at the end of the bar. (laughs) William, yes. Talking his shit. Come in, talk <laughs> talking about. Talking his shit. You no, know, oh, come on, baby. Why don't you just, you should just apply to the job again, baby. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you never know. You know, which pissed her off. And I really understand. I hate, like the, I think what they call it now is toxic positivity. <laughs> which is when you're trying I to talk this. to somebody about some real shit. And they're like, well, hey, you never know what happens. Right. The sun comes out tomorrow. And it's like, yeah, okay, but I'm trying to talk to you about pain. I'm trying to talk to you about something real that you don't understand, you know? She told him, you know, I fucking know a lot. Yes. And that she wouldn't even have to run if she was in his skin. Why not just apply anyway? You never know. I fucking know a lot. I know there are 103 employees at that damn department store, and two of them are never going to be colored. I know that because for us... It's a rat race to the finish line, and it's winner takes it all. And I damn for sure know that if I was in your skin, I wouldn't even have to run. What I don't know is what to do about it. Every once in a while, you got to do that. You got to check somebody and remind them that, like, our circumstances are not the same. So our trajectories are not going to be the same. And you have to let me live in my reality. And if you're not going to help me, at the very least, you could let me tell my story and shut the fuck up. Right. And he does. And I think that's why in the end he gets to have a wonderful night with Ruby. Because he does shut the fuck up. He got that one. And then they end up. I mean that too. We should talk about what appears to be WAP happening on the staircase. (laughs) Yes. I love this sex scene so much. I don't know that I approve of Ruby sleeping with William, but... I mean, of course not. He's making promises. Ruby ain't trying to hear that. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think at the end, even in sleeping with him, it's not because she believes him. Oh, absolutely. It's not because she thinks he's really about to change her life. It's because today has been some bullshit And he Mm -hmm. seems just smooth enough to break me off without me feeling in the end like I just added to my bad day. (laughs) 
absolutely. It's what she deserves. I think she had a great time. The sex scene is actually a direct reference to the film that the episode is named after, A History of Violence. One of my favorite films. I haven't seen it in a long-ass time, but, I mean, if you've ever seen it, you'll never forget this sex scene on the staircase. Um, Shout out to Viggo Mortensen, because I was... Deeply turned on, deeply not turned on, (laughs) deeply concerned about why I was attracted to him so much in this fucking crazy movie. Um, But that movie is also about, like, the inescapability of your past, the past always coming back to haunt you. And, like, the lies that you have to tell your family to get through it. That's what I think about, and I think about the connection to the episode, and I think about that staircase scene. She's messing with them, you know, like, but she's also messing with herself. I think... Every Black person has come to a point at some point in their lives where they look at a situation and goes, all right, like this is, I'm not supposed to be doing stuff like this, but you know what? Everybody else gets to do things like this Mm. and then just live their lives and be okay. Yeah. Like, why can that be me for just one night? Can I get what I want for one night? Can I do something adventurous or bad or whatever that I'm not concerned about how it looks to anybody else? Can I do it just one time and like go about my business and live my life? And to be perfectly honest, Ruby, we have yet to see whether or not you can give up the WAP to a man like William and still walk away feeling like I won. We'll figure out how that goes. I love it for Ruby, and I think she is, like, honestly, one of our hardest working characters. She's always working, and she's trying to get another job. Like, she's tired. She did what needed to be done. This actress is also, like, so fucking good. Wunmi Mosaka. She's so good. Get into her. This episode, uh, it's heavy. We've talked about some of the really heavy themes. One thing that I want to end with here is in thinking about this question of the master's tools— Like, what Montrose doesn't do, and what all of our characters, a lot of times, they don't get to do because they're reacting, right? Mm -hmm. Our lives are on the line. We have to do something. Let's react quickly. Burn it down. Destroy this. Kill this person. Run away. Pack your back. Like, a lot of it is very reactive, and they don't allow themselves to really sit with certain questions, again, due to the fact that there's limited time also due to the fact that it's a TV show and we want them to react quickly to things. But for everybody watching, I do feel like there should be a conversation after this. And it's the conversation we're trying to have right now, like really interrogating what are those tools? Is our goal just to replace the colonizer, right? That's the question. Right. (laughs) Is our goal simply to kill who we need to kill to get to the level of power and or safety and or comfort that they have. Right. And if that is the case, we're probably in trouble. Big trouble. Um, I think it's also important that we be thinking about these Black heroes and how they're going to be flawed humans influenced by a very flawed country. Yes. We also want to be thinking about the fact that Changing this really does require leading with compassion and not being afraid to be wrong. Mm. You're going to mess up. We're all going to mess up at some point. And we need to be able to talk about it. We need to be able to deal with it. And we need to be able to make proper amends to do better in the future. So I don't know um, that amends have ever truly been part of the tools in the master's toolbox. So... Maybe that's one we can start with. Yeah, we've talked about love. That word has come up a few times in this recording and thinking about like the love that comes from our parents and how that love plays out in these fucked up ways and what we can do about that. So in addition to the master's tools, I'm also thinking about Audre Lorde's uses of the erotic, which I know I brought up recently, but that's because I just read it again and I'm obsessed. But that essay is also about like, love and pleasure and feeling and using those as tools of activism as well. Like, it doesn't all have to be like those heavy, big, violent things that we think are power. Power is soft. Power is feminine. Power is gentle. Power is love and compassion. And yes, masturbation too, (laughs) which is also what the essay is about. Um, But along those same lines, in thinking about pleasure and joy which we always try to bring it back to. What's hilarious about how deep this podcast 
just went is like, to me, episode four is actually one of our most lighthearted episodes of the show. Like, they go on a family road trip. It's fun. Everybody's annoyed. Diana and Hippolyta come along and they're not supposed to, and that causes things. Diana and Hippolyta looking at the stars, and we learn about how fucking Hippolyta named a comet that she didn't get credit for. Like, there's fun. There's laughter. There's a museum. Like, Goonies adventure style stuff is happening. And I I think that's also always a part of the theme of this show. Within these questions about master's tools, there's also like, don't forget joy. Don't forget pleasure. Don't forget how fun it is to pile in a car and drive, you know, to another state with your family. Like all of that is a huge part of Black resistance in this country. Also, like the music of this episode, I think everybody's going to be talking about Bitch Better Have My Money and Christina. Oh my goodness. So yeah, and we have Cardi B. So it's it's a fun episode with some deep stuff and uh, obviously plenty more of that to come. Let's leave our audience with some references and recommendations coming out of episode four. All right, let's talk about The Goonies. All right, classic film. Yeah. All right, we want to talk about wrecked ships. You want to talk about people almost drowning. You want to talk about treasure, skeletons, mummies, all of those things. Yes, get into The Goonies. Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark is a fantastic film about a white man essentially stopping bad white people from stealing artifacts, but then also being a bad white person and taking the artifacts to a museum and not returning them to the people (laughs) who actually own them on the land. Uh, But still, watch it. Pirates of the Caribbean. You probably have already seen that one, but definitely plays in. The Gender of Sound by Ann Carson. Shannon, tell me more about that. Oh my God, an amazing essay. Uh, that I just read this year in an incredible class that I was taking with our mutual friend, Ricky Laurentis. Um, A fantastic person. Oh, my God. So Ricky taught this seminar, and one of our first assignments was this essay. And when I read the essay, I was like, oh, my God, this is Yehima. It's about literally the sound of women's voices and how it has been demonized throughout the course of history. So in thinking about Yehima being turned into a siren and literally the sound of their voice destroying you, I just was like, okay, everybody has to read this. But it's also just a great interrogation of, again, all those things that we take for granted. I thought about all the times that I was like, oh my God, I don't want to do this podcast. I have the most annoying voice in the world. Ashley sounds so much sexier than me, but now that I've read The Gender of Sound, (laughs) I have come to terms with it. So yes, Gender of Sound by Ann Carson, A History of Violence, excellent David Cronenberg movie. The short story I mentioned earlier, Like a Winding Sheet by Ann Petrie. And two Audre Lorde essays, The Master's Tools essay that we referenced, and also Uses of the Erotic. That's amazing. Shannon, thank you so much for talking with me today about this show. Oh my gosh, we're only on episode four. Ah! I know, I know, I know, but five is coming and oh I'm ready if you are. I'm almost ready. I'll get ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our show for this week. Thank you so much for listening. This show is hosted by us. I'm Shannon Houston. And I'm Ashley C. Ford. This podcast was produced by HBO in conjunction with Pineapple Street Studios. Our executive producers are Jenna Weiss Berman, Max Linsky, and Barry Finkel. Aganaresh Ashagre is our managing producer. This episode's lead producer is Jess Jupiter. And our associate producers are Alexis Moore and Natalie Brennan. Our editors are Maddie Sprung Kaiser and Josh Gwen. Noriko Akabe is our engineer. Original music by composer Amanda Jones. If you like the show and you have a minute, you can review and rate this podcast via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you might get your podcasts. It really helps people find the show. You can also stream the podcast on HBO and HBO Max. We'll be back next week for episode five, which premieres on HBO and streams on HBO Max on September 13th at 9 p.m. Eastern.